Hello and welcome to the Nightmare Vault and today we'll be looking at a, well, a personal favourite of mine, which I think a lot of the ones I'm going to be covering, to well, on this series are going to be personal favourites or ones that I really enjoyed or thought were neat. Mm. But this is like the big one. Like if you were to come to me like back when I was in my teens, this would have been my answer to my favourite creepypasta and that is the Russian sleep experiment. Although before we get into it, um, we kind of... Did a bit of looking around, but we couldn't quite find the original author, so I guess yeah. the author is kind of unknown. Well, yes. the original, so. Yeah. If any of you know, kind of don't literally leave. If Well, if you have a good idea of who the original author is, mm. leave it down in the comments. For sure. That'd be awesome. I guess we'll get into it. Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them. Since it was toxic in high concentrations, this was before closed circuit cameras, so they had only microphones and five inch thick glass porthole sized windows into the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stocked with books, cots to sleep on, but no bedding, running water and toilet. Had enough dried food to last all five for over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during the Second World War. Everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects hardly complained having been promised falsely that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversation and activities were monitored and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidents in their past and the general tone of their conversations took on a darker aspect after the four day mark. After five days, they started to complain about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other and began alternatively whispering to the microphones. They stopped talking to each other and began alternatively whispering to the microphone and one way mirrored portholes. Oddly, they all seemed to think they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning over their comrades. Their other subjects in captivity with them, at first the researchers suspected this was an effect of the gas itself. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber, repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about this behaviour is how the other captives reacted to it, or rather didn't react to it. They continued whispering to the microphone until the second of the captives started to scream. The two non-screaming captives took the books apart, smeared page after page with their own feces and pasted them calmly over the glass portholes. The screaming promptly stopped. So did the whispering to the microphones. After three more days passed, the researchers checked the microphones early to make sure they were working. Since they thought it impossible that no sound could be coming with five people inside, the oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. On the morning of the 14th day, the researchers did something they said they would not do to get a reaction from the captives. They used the intercom inside the chamber hoping to provoke any response from the captives. They were afraid were either dead or vegetables. They announced, we are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm voice response we no longer want to be freed. Debate broke out among the researchers and the military forces funding the research. Unable to provoke 
any more response using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chambers at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed of all the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. Three different voices began begging as if pleading for the life of loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was opened and soldiers sent in to achieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever and so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside. Four of the five subjects were still alive, although no one could rightly call the state that any of them in life. The food rations past day five had not been so much as touched. There were chunks of meat from the dead test subjects thighs and chest stuffed into the drain in the corner of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of the water on the floor was actually blood was never determined. All four surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth as the researchers initially thought. Closer examination of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most, if not all of them, were self-inflicted. The abnormal organs below the ribcage of all four test subjects had been removed, while the heart, lungs and diaphragm remained in place. The skin and most of the muscles attached to the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs through the ribcage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had just been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could be seen to be working digesting food. It quickly became apparent that what they were digesting was their own flesh that they had ripped off and eaten over the course of days. Most of the soldiers were Russian special operatives at the facility but still many refused to return to the chamber to remove the test subjects. They continued to scream to be left in the chamber and alternatively begged and demanded that the gas be turned back on, lest they fall asleep. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out, another was gravely injured by having his testicles ripped off and an artery in his leg severed by one of the subjects teeth. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives if you count ones that committed suicide in the weeks following the incident. In the struggle, one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him but this proved impossible. He was injected with more than 10 times the human dose of a morphine derivative and still fought like a cornered animal breaking the ribs and arm of one of the doctor. When Hart was seen to beat for a full two minutes after he had bled out to the point there was more air in his vascular system than blood, even after it stopped he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in reach and just repeating the word more over and over, weaker and weaker, until he finally fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility. The two with intact vocal cords continuously begging for the gas demanded to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room that the facility had. In the process of preparing the subjects to have his organs placed back within his body, it was found that he was effectively immune to the sedative they had given him to prepare him for the surgery. He fought furiously against his restraints when the anesthetic's gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a four inch wide leather strap on one wrist. Even though the weight of a 200 pound soldier holding that wrist as well. It took only a little more anesthetic than normal to put him under and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject, 
that had died on the operating table, it was found that his blood had tripled the normal level of oxygen. His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn and he had broken nine bones and he struggled to not be subdued. Most of them were from the force his own muscles had exerted on them. The second survivor had been the first of the group of five to start screaming. His vocal cords destroyed, he was unable to beg or object to surgery and he only reacted by shaking his head violently in a disapproval when the anaesthetic gas was brought near him. He shook his head yes when someone suggested reluctantly that they try the surgery without anaesthetics and did not react for the entire six hour procedure of replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. A surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it should be medically possible for the patient to still be alive. One terrified nurse assisting the surgery said that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of a drastic importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched so the patient could write his message. It was simple, keep cutting. The other two subjects were given the same surgery, both without anaesthetic as well. Although they had to be injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation, the surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralysed, the subjects could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short period of time and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves, why they had ripped out their own guts and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one response was given. I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced and they were placed back into the chamber awaiting determination as to what should be done with them. The researchers facing the wrath of their military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of their project considered euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer and ex-KGB instead saw potential and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected but were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going back on the gas. It was obvious that at this point all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining his legs against the leather bonds with all his might. First left, then right, then left again for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and blinking rapidly, having been the first to be wired for EEG. Most of the researchers were monitoring his brain waves in surprise. They were normal most of the time, but sometimes flatlined inexplicably. It looked as if he were repeatedly suffering brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the same moment his head hit the pillow. His brainwaves immediately changed to that of a deep sleep then flatlined for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. Only remaining subject that could speak started to scream to be sealed in now. His brainwaves showed the same flatlines as one who had just died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as the three researchers. One of the named three immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point blank between the eyes, then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed his gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to the bed as the remaining member of the medical and research team fled the room. I won't be locked in here with these things. Not with you, he screamed at the man strapped to the table. 
What are you? he demanded. I must know. The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? The subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go to the nocturnal heaven where we cannot tread. The researcher paused, then aimed at the subject's head and fired. The EEG flatlined as the subject weakly choked out. So nearly free. And there we have it. Oh God, doing the voice for this, <laughs> the, that last subject. Oh, <laughs> that was painful. Obviously, it's, I got some very strong forks about strong forks. Strong, <laughs> strong thoughts. I gotta say, Re, uh, what the fuck's with my brain today? <laughs> so I guess Marissa, start with your thoughts on it. Sure, I would say overall, it is definitely an intriguing story. You know, I I want a little bit more information of like of the gas itself so i want like a bit of like prequel information and then oh yeah that would be um, nice yeah to sort of fill in some of those information gaps of like yeah what is the gas um exactly i think actually it adds more to the mystery as yeah what is the gas yeah so what is gas (laughs) or i guess um at least like not exactly what it is but yeah some sort of origin of how they got to this point would be interesting there definitely were a few moments in there you know grammatically or even just there was a few moments where like just simple words missing um oh yeah like like, yeah with the example of one of the doctors being injured it said doctor instead of doctors because it should be uh, ripping the arm off one of the doctors and i actually accidentally did that yeah and there was a couple of times as well where you sort of yeah just naturally went to add you know, a word in that kind of should be there just to improve the flow of the sentence. Oh, yeah, um, so there's going to be a lot of outtakes with that. <laughs> but and, um, and a lot of cussing too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there were some moments where it was sort of like overly wordy sentences that didn't quite flow very smoothly. But other than that, I do find this like a really good story. Yeah, I would say there was only, yeah, I would say... Probably two moments for me where it there was kind of like null points where I was like a little bit losing it. One point at the start where, yeah, there was just sort of like a section which was just very wordy and it wasn't quite oh, yeah. moving the story along. Um, but I think that wasn't that where it's kind of setting the stage anyway. Uh, it's, it is a bit of that as well. You're definitely right. Yeah, it's sort of setting the stage, but it could just be improved slightly so it's a bit more interesting, I guess. But And then, yeah, same with where they're taking the patients out and starting to, like, do tests on them. There was a moment in there where, again, it's getting a little bit wordy and um, I want things to move along a bit quicker. But overall, like, yeah, the idea, I, I almost feel I've seen this idea in a movie before. Um, oh, or at yeah. least, like, something similar. I wouldn't be surprised. Because, yeah, there is, like... There's a movie, well, there's a series of movies called Cube or The Cube, um, whereas, yeah, like people just wake up inside. Oh, yeah. I think I've seen bits and pieces of it. Yeah. It's it's not great. Um, but, hey, but yeah, it's pretty good. But, yeah, it's, it's not bad. I haven't seen any of the sequels, but I've seen the first one. And, yeah, it's got something like that going for it. It's got a little bit of like a saw, at least a saw one sort of element of, yeah, sort of like, people locked in a room locked in a room <laughs> yeah i guess yeah there's definitely a lot of questions of like there's that moment where you know even the doctors are wondering like what's going on in there so there's that sort of like blank time of like how the hell did these people fuse um and like everything's di- being digested by all of them that was yeah some some really interesting sort of like gruesome uh imagery there which um, even as you were reading it, I was like, oh, that's, that's <laughs> like, gross. Yeah, it doesn't have as much effect on me because I'm, well, used to the story now. But, yeah, yeah, I kind of had a similar feeling when first time listening to the story, actually. I bet. It definitely had me on the edge of my seat. Yeah, definitely that. That sort of, yeah, middle section where there's, like, a lot of suspense and tension 
um, just sort of building. Actually, that's one thing I really like about the story is like, yeah, it just slowly the tension ratchets up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until it just hits the climax. Yeah, that was cool. And then even because, yeah, there's a little bit of a null point, as I sort of said, after that where, yeah, they're sort of doing testing and things, but then it sort of ramps back up again as, you know, the, the test subjects are now able to sort of like communicate a little bit of like, yeah, why they need to stay awake. The only sort of shortcoming that I have, just knowing, um, you know, I've done first aid course, I know exactly like as soon as someone flatlines, there's zero possibility of them coming back. So that moment in there where it's like, I can see how the writing is trying to build the tension around that like, he's flatlining, he's back, he's about to flatline, he's flatlining, he's back. You know, that builds a lot of story tension, but like in reality, it doesn't quite work. I, um, I'm just trying to think, it wasn't, I think it was like brain activity, so yeah. Yeah. Um, when the brain flatlines, you're fucked. Yeah. So so there, there is some um, some plot holes sort of Well, like if there. the heart flatlines, well, you do have a bit of time window. Um, I'm not, not sure. Not a large one, that. but you do have a little bit of time when the heart stops. Not like a shit ton, but yeah. if someone's quick on it, yeah, there's a chance that they can bring you back. Potentially, yeah. So, yeah, other than like that but i guess even though you know i'm saying like in reality obviously this story is it's got you know, those elements of um supernatural sort of like sci-fi in it um, which i find kind of nice yeah it's so, like yes it's like sci-fi supernatural but it does yeah. sort of feel realistic at the same time yeah so even though like i'm trying to pull it apart from a realistic point of view um you know it, it's definitely very immersive yeah 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 um so, yeah, I would say overall, you know, it's it's definitely compelling. I'm interested for more, whether it's, yeah, sort of like directly connected or even just sort of like almost in the vein of um, sort of like the Cloverfield series where like you have different stories within... A single one, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, within like <clears throat> a single set of events. Um, that could be really cool. Like we'll sort of... Um, before we started recording, we were sort of discussing like the general gist of the story and like potentially this could be, you know, like an American doctor or researcher or whatever um, investigator, you're know, going over the report and then like you could have a, an American um, sleep experiment sort of like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Amer- yeah, the Russian sleep experiments at home. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, God. <laughs> I can see the beam template for that now. <laughs> Yeah. That'd be hilarious. So, what's um, you know, you mentioned that you know this is probably your your, your favorite. Oh wait, um, oh no, that's basically Russian sleep experiment too. It's basically just Russian sleep experiment at home. Right, right, right. So yeah, you you mentioned this is pretty much you know your, oh yeah your favorite. So what about it? You know, it makes it stand out from all the other crew. I think actually, stories. kind of just talking about it, kind of already explained all the the big points that I really like about it. It's just that again, tension and suspense, as well as that kind of sense of like looming dread that something bad's about to happen. Yeah, for sure. For that's sure. what makes it really good, in my opinion. Okay, cool. And actually, that's one of the things I like about horror movies, especially ones that have like a lot of like suspense and tension. Like you know, these people are going to die, but it's the matter of when. Mm, yeah, the, the the clock ticking and um, not knowing when it's going to stop. Yeah, so yeah. like having moments where it kind of fakes out and builds up tension mm. just for out of nowhere to something to happen. For sure. I just really enjoy that. I guess, yeah, now that you're sort of saying it, you know, like they could have definitely ended the story at that moment of them opening up the, the, the chamber doors and you know, they could have easily, yeah, just found them all dead and, you know, there would be it definitely wouldn't have been as compelling because, yeah, from that sort of moment, it starts building it up again and you start getting some questions answered. So, yeah, there's definitely a few moments within this story where it's building tension. You get a little bit of a release and some some questions answered, but it then starts again, the cycle of, of tension building. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll say, well, I guess... You did kind of do get your thoughts on it, but what did you really like about it? Although I think, and we kind of just when I was explaining why I really liked it, I think it's just the same reason. Yeah, I would say the the the, the thing I liked about it the most probably would be 
you know, now thinking about over it again probably would be the fact that, yeah, not everything actually is answered, that even at this point... It does point, leave a few questions open. Yeah, it leaves it open, I guess, for some, yeah, interpretation. Um, you can put your own sort of theories in there, but it also, yeah, leaves it open for you know, other people to come in and, and potentially, yeah, make adjacent stories, um, you know, pre, pre-events and post-events. Um, I, I kind of did with the sequel, which I'm not sure if we're going to be covering anytime soon, but it'd be fun to compare considering Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the sequel. Yeah, I do enjoy listening to the sequel, but I find it quite inferior to the original. And I guess that is um, quite typical when it comes to, to sequels. Sequel, I would say sequelitis. Yeah, yeah. So... Although we've definitely got some sequels that kind of outshine the original. Absolutely. Like the Ju- Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Like, yes, the original's really good, but the second one is really good. <laughs> that is one, yeah, I, I have a ha- hard time picking which one I like more because I do like both of them a lot. But, yeah, you, you get even with, um, uh, I mean, there's a big big debate over Alien and Aliens. I was about to bring that up too. As well, yeah. Um, actually, I have a really hard time telling between the two, even though I recently just rewatched the two of them. Yeah. They're both are really solid. They definitely are. I think for, for me, my pick there is definitely Alien. I like the um, the more sort of horror suspense elements of it. But, yeah, Aliens is, is good as well. I think that's what I like most about this one is is that not all questions are answered, but still some are. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess as for what I don't like about it, um, probably would be, yes, yeah, parts of the pacing. Some of it is really good. Some of it just kind of meanders about a little bit. I think that actually sort of helps the story a bit. Maybe, yeah. I mean, it does add a few points here and there, but... Um, also, I think I would like a little bit more dialogue. Oh, so like a bit more of an exchange between the test subjects and the researchers. Either that or even just like researcher it's to just, researcher or even like how they mention. No, yeah, that would be neat to have a bit more research to researcher, even, even, uh, yeah, even, even. <laughs> <laughs> or even just exchanges between the um, the soldiers and the researchers. Ab- absolutely. That's what I was going to say as well. Yeah. Just, yeah, a little bit more. That, that would almost like be some opportunities to add some tension, particularly there between the researchers and the um, soldiers because you, you're not quite told if there's like a positive relationship there, if, if like maybe the researchers are potentially, you know, sort of subjugated, captured themselves. Um, well, it doesn't really explain it. Well, I think it's more just kind of the soldiers are just around there to kind of just do the grunt work basically. There is potentially that, but yeah, it's sort of That's like... That's what the vibe I get is like they're just there to do kind of sort of the heavy lifting, so to yeah. speak. Yeah, yeah, that could be a massive part of it or, um, yeah, you, you don't get a guess, uh, yeah, you don't get a lot of that, yeah, top down of like the purpose of the experiment. So just a little bit um, of, yeah, like dialogue could sort of fill in some of those smaller gaps as well. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, there's definitely a, a lot of long points where it's just sort of like setting something up, setting up like the next scene and that kind of thing or just like setting the environment where, yeah, to have some dialogue set those bits up. Um, Although cool. yeah. I guess with your complaint of about the pacing, wouldn't that actually hurt the pacing more? Well, potentially, but I think... Breaking it up. So instead of having, yeah, like one big section where it's just the narrator telling us about what's happening, it would break it up so you'd have these characters coming in and tell us rather than, yeah, just full narration the whole time. So, yeah, I was yeah. actually kind of on that idea. I was thinking like doing, well, if I was to do my own version of having it from the perspective of like journal entries. Mm. Yeah, that could be interesting as well. Um, yeah, so journal from the perspective of... So, like, yes, it is, like, one narrator, but it's his journal entries mm. that are being narrated. From, uh, like, one of the researchers? Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that that could be interesting as well. I guess then you, you do sort of, yeah, run the opposite risk of then the whole time it is, yeah, just sort of, um, you know, characters are speaking to himself. 
But yeah, it, 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 it could. Um, well, uh, although that not only that, but we're doing kind of like general entries is also you can kind of tell what's going on, but they're more so kind of have like the person's thoughts yeah. on what's going on too. You get there. Which gives you a lot more options. Yeah. I think that would be kind of cool for if you were to like adapt this to like a mini series or something like that. That way you could have, yeah, those moments of journal entry be quite interesting. Um, Although if we were to do it that for us, we at least have to have one Boris. <laughs> at least one. Absolutely. And then maybe like a Sergei. Cool. Um, should we finish off by rating? Oh, yeah. I'll say, what would you rate it out of 10? Ooh. I think because, yeah, there is quite a lot of potential there. I'm probably going to go maybe a 7. I think a 7 out of 10. It's it's up there. There's, yeah, as I said, there's a little bit of, you know, tweaking to, I guess, my personal tastes, but... Overall, it is quite good and has that potential to be expanded. So, yeah, I think a 7 out of 10 for me. How about you? I'd say personally for me, and this, I'm, I'm going to do like what I did with the first one I covered, which is like my personal score and then yep. like how it can, well, and then me rating it a bit more realistically as a oh, creepy past compared to other stuff. Yeah. Personally, I would have to say it's an, a solid 9. Okay. Which I think just shows how biased I am here. <laughs> yes. As a um, creepy pastor compared to a lot of the other stuff and that. It definitely, um, it's still as good as I remember it being, but just, again, some of the, the wording is a bit, well, jank, to put yeah. it simply. <laughs> so I'd have to probably, what, compared to other creepy pastors, give it an eight. To, uh, I'll only add to that, but I'm definitely going to give it the award of being one of the goats. Okay, cool. Nice. Yeah, I definitely think an eight's pretty fair as well. Um, obviously, I'm not as versed in creepypasta as you are, so I definitely can't comment on if it is a goat or not. But um, I guess but yeah, moving I, forward, this is definitely the reason why I'm giving it. Well, the I guess the award of being one of the goats is yep. that it's a really good example of a really good creepypasta. Okay. So I'm using that kind of as a baseline for entry to be a, considered even a goat. Nice. That's to be near. Yeah. A okay. Russian sleep experiment. Cool. So, yeah, this is sort of like, yeah, the standard for, for goat status, um, at least for you. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Well, I guess, well, next time you'll be probably picking out some random creepy pasta. Yes. And then after that, we'll be covering the Harbinger experiment because if we've, we're have we going to cover this one, we have to cover the Harbinger. Sounds good to me. Let us know your thoughts on the Russian sleep experiment. Um, is and this not only that, but do you want us to cover the sequel? Yeah. The Russian sleep experiment to Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, AKA the Russian sleep experiment and home. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, let us know. Are there any other, any of your favorites that we should cover um, that we haven't mentioned yet? It'd be funny if you picked out the sequel right. to cover next. <laughs> Maybe. I have an idea in mind of what I might pick, but um, I'll consider it. Okay. Yeah. So next week may or may not be Russian sleep experiment tea. <laughs> we'll see. So that brings you out. <laughs>